as I stood back there, I decided that I want to dedicate this talk to those who have ever, at any time, those of you who have felt disremembered and unaccounted for, for the she, the he, the they, the them. This talk I'm about to get into is for you. John Bradshaw and Dr. Brene Brown initiated the modern conversation about the concept of shame. That word that is often not spoken about. And let me say it again, shame. Pay attention to how that lands in the body. For some of you, perhaps it's intellectual. For others, it's somatic. And even others, it can be emotional, spiritual. Bradshaw posits that the only way to be free is to share our shame with a benevolent witness, someone who will not shame us for our shame. And Dr. Brown says, we are desperately unwilling to experience shame. And we are unwilling to talk about it. Well, guess what? I am here today to talk about it. In the work that I get to do, holding space, sitting side by side with dog walkers to billionaires, we all have one thing in common, and that is to learn to bear the weight of that which we can't hold and believe to be true about ourselves, that we cannot see, that we are unwilling to be exposed to, let alone allow someone else to see it. And that is our shame. I see it as if I can be that benevolent witness, if I can sit side by side with another human being with a cleared out heart, mirroring the possibility for them to clear out their heart, then you know what we get to do? We get to take the problem and we get to put it in the center so that this human being knows they are not their shame message. The problem is not you, but the problem is out there. And then we sit and we rock with intimacy, empathy, possibility, and that can build to resilience and intimacy. I love what I do. I'm good at it. As a matter of fact, I'm gifted at it. And one of the things that I love, I'm going to be a little playful right now, is every time I show up in front of the room or I meet with a team, I make sure my fit is spot on, okay? And before I go any further, I would like to thank that cashier at the nines with that boss white haircut. Thank you for these jeans. <laughs> yeah. The people I work with, they always say, ooh, you got mad shoe drip. Or they'll say, oh my God, your shoe game is fire! But what they don't know is there's a little girl inside of me who is on fire. There is a little girl that informs my shame message that I am unwanted. And what they don't know is that I will take 
$2,500 worthy of a mortgage in an upscale neighborhood while I pay rent in an apartment to buy that amazing pair of Manolo's, Prada, Gucci. They don't know that it's a gift as well as a deflection because we can make it about the shoes. As ludicrous as it sounds, shame thrives on the ridiculousness. And what I also believe is every single person in this room that's wearing shoes, your shoes, have a story to tell. And here is mine. The first pair of shoes I ever had were handmade from scraps of two-by-fours left over from Daddy Lent's woodworkings. He was Big Mama's husband. They were my first caretaker. Seemed like I was always in need of a new pair of shoes. Also seemed like I was always in need of an ass whooping and for what it really didn't matter. So one day, I put two and two together. I took the belt they used to beat me with, a fistful of nails and a handsaw, and I made those shoes. All I wanted was to be like that girl Dorothy and click my heels together three times so that my shoes would take me home to wherever that might be because where I lived, where I live, we cocktailed yelling and screaming and spun it in to a sense of overwhelming where the only place to be that was the safest was disassociated and out of my body. In the house I lived in, hunger arrived, fisted and angry and punched hard every day. Scarcity, arm wrestled, poverty entwined in a dance to try and break a cycle they knew nothing about. Yeah. <laughs> Being love starved can make us all hungry ghosts. Our bellies extended with desires we cannot feed. Why? Because, lest, as the Buddhists would say, our mouths are too small, our necks too thin. I was surprised the day that I was pulled into the office and told that I would be sent home earlier than all the other kids in the school. And when I asked why, they reminded me that I kept the promise of beating up all my classmates that I did not like because my mother broke her promise to come and get me, to take me with her, to have me, to hold me to love me. By the time I left my caretakers on that ACE assessment test, which only goes to 10, I exhibited nine. And when I arrived in that level 14 residential treatment center, not so different than the one Paris Hilton lived in, except there was no daddy to foot the bill. The state took over, begrudgingly so. And I found myself in solitary confinement, in a room where there were no handles on the doors. There were no windows. There was no toilet, no bed. So yes, I spent 
a better part of my adolescence in my own feces and urine. It was in that room that I prayed for a mother I hardly knew to a God who had promised me that if I believed, I would have everlasting life. Well, I put him to the test. And it was in that room, in the dark and in the dank, that actually my inner world became more quiet because I became a benevolent witness to myself, although I didn't know it then. And there was a small voice that said, speak into the light, speak into the light. And so I would get my little teenage body down on that concrete floor, and I would speak my transgressions into the light. I would speak my apologies to myself for the self-harm, the cutting, the starving, the hating, the withdrawing from life, the erasure. I wrote my dreams into that light. Not so unlike the little girls who were also 16 years old who had their journal or their diary and they laid on their canopy beds writing their legs crossed at the ankle, rocking their possibility into existence. It takes a tremendous amount of desire, self, to do what I am asking. It's difficult, it's challenging to sit side by side to not judge yourself first so that you don't have the practice of judging others, but instead to do what Nick Hill asks you to do, and that is to listen. But before we can be willing to listen, we have to be willing to bear the weight of another's shame. That which we don't want to know about ourselves, that which I don't want any of you to know about me. So, being who I am, a woman who behaves badly because I think it's important for me to go down in history, I am she. Okay, we're going to flip that axiom on its head. And, and being who I am and being, I never ask permission because I show up as permission, right? And being that I am that, I decided that I needed a word that I've never been able to find in the American Dictionary. I needed a word that could bring difficulty and challenging into the center where it can, the things that we do that are difficult and challenging could be elevated to exceptional. Because those of us who bear our shame and are willing to hold it and be with it and see it and move into ourselves, turn into ourselves with empathy and intimacy, that's exceptional. So, with a little help from ChatGPT, I put difficult and challenging into the space. And what it gave me back is the word exdificent. On the count of three, I want to hear y'all say it like you mean it. One, two, three. Exdificent. And you want to know what that term implies? It implies that there is a bridge between difficult and challenging. There was a bridge that I didn't quite understand when I was that little girl, and I would pray and offer my desires and lamentations into that light. Right? And that bridge is exdificent. It can lead us 
two qualities of our true character, of our true spirit as we navigate this world as spiritual beings having a human experience. So that is my invitation for you to live ex, ex deficiently. I'm going to add that L-Y. That is my ask of you to sit with your own shame, to understand the weight of your own shame message and be the benevolent witness you need so that you know how to do that for you, your children, your lovers, your friends, your spouses, your siblings, your communities. Thank you for listening.